If you want to snipe some sick cash, there's a service called Alpha Draft, which is a fantasy esports site, and they have CSGO and they have numerous tournaments on there, Road to Vegas, CES tournaments, for example, online, ESL, ESEA, all the time. So, description box below if you want to look at the link there. Now, about a week and a half ago, I published my Reflections interview with Fraud, which I will link there. <coughs> And in the interview, at the end of the interview, Fraud reveals he wants to come back to CSGO, or CS rather, he didn't really go that hardcore into CSGO. He wants to be a full-time professional again, but he wants to do it for a proper team. He doesn't want to just do it for some no-name team, he wants to go full-on. It's now been announced that Complexity have signed Fraud, and he will be in their next lineup, which is hoping to t compete, for example, in the Turn League, in North American lands, and ideally international lands for next year, 2016. So the big news is he's come back there, and obviously Complexity was the team where he really built the brand of that team with his individual players, the star franchise player, and that's where he had his best results. So an interesting story there. Now, as a CS 1.6 player, he's one of the best of all time. For North Americans, he probably is the best player of all time. If you try and weigh it up, there's, you can make arguments for other people, but I think a lot of people, and I think I would agree, I would plump for Fraud as the best player because he, he was a full-on carry player. He achieved a lot of success. He was a world champion. He won a lot of money, and he had quite a number of years of longevity to his career. So in terms of actual prize money won, in 1.6... He won around, his teams rather, won o over $400,000. So individually, about $80,000. Now that places him top 21 of all time. He's the 21st player of all time in 1.6 for prize money won. So for a North American, that's very good. A lot of the players obviously on that list are Swedish that are above him or, or Nordic players in general. So to be that high up for a, a North American player is extremely good. It shows kind of the longevity and the success he had in his career. Now... I'll run through some of the basics of his career, <clears throat> but on these parts, I've realized for these sorts of videos, you want to know some of the results and the ups and downs, but you don't know every result. Like, that gets a bit too monotonous. And plus, since this is actually a player I've known and had a decent amount of interaction with over his career, I can also give you some other insights. So in terms of his career, he was originally noticed as just an online player playing for Green Berets, who are like a low-level invite team actually led by GB James, who is the guy who is the coach of Liquid as of this moment, if he hasn't already been fired, fingers crossed. So anyway, he played for that team, but he wasn't a known player and they weren't a good team and they finished essentially last place at CPL Winter 2002, one of the majors of that year, North American line, but had international teams there. Finished basically last place. Then in 2003, he started playing with a team called AOX early on, Art of Execution, and in online performances, he was making the Cal Invite playoffs. Cal Invite was the equivalent of like Sevo or somewhat, whatever the top league would be in North America now or ESEA. He, was, he made it to the playoffs, but that was about it. And he was actually featured very early on in a little movie that got Frag made about the playoffs. And so as a result, he was in that movie very briefly with an open clip on Inferno. And so people started to know him as like a good AWPA. And there were some POV demos around at the time. But the thing is, it was all online competition. And the problem back in the days there is that if you were just good online and you hadn't accomplished anything offline, and remember, he'd finished last place at his first CPL, everyone would assume either you cheated or they would make fun of you, they think you're like a pussy or you have no nerve because you can't play on LAN. And just to break this down a little bit, the reason why that was so entrenched in the scene is because the first generation of great North American players, you know, your K-Sharp, Rambo, Moto, these sorts of players essentially were the guys where they were almost prodigies at the game. They were just good from day one on LAN. When they went to their first CPLs back in 2001, 2002, whatever, 2000 in some of their cases, they were just good from day one. They were already good on LAN, and some of them were the best players in the world already on LAN. So to them, the, the notion that you could be good on LAN, but you hadn't figured it out on LAN yet, was alien to them, and it also made, they almost like were disgusted and repulsed by it. So they'd push you away if you were good on LAN, but hadn't been good on LAN. Whereas now in CSGO, okay, we still have that mentality to a degree, but but everyone also realizes, unless this guy has some really ser serious nerve issues, if he plays enough lands, he's going to get the experience and he's probably going to be almost as good. Sometimes they turn out to be as good or better. Obviously, some of them turn out to be phenomenal. Some of them are never quite as good. Like, for example, Tarek's never been quite good offline as he was online in many of the early years in CSGO. But most of the time, they'll figure it out. So now people understand the process. But back then, there was a massive, there was kind of like a mental block in the top teams as a result. So as a result, players like Fraud had to make it the hard way. So... In 2003, he's playing for a team called United Five. And they actually, another member of the team was Moses, who's now an analyst and does a lot of commentary, does it for ESL, ESEA, did it for DreamHack, did a bunch of tournaments. <clears throat> and 
at this, they go to a tournament, CPL Winter 2003, so a year later from the one where Fraud finished last place. And this lineup actually shocks the world. They managed to finish top eight. They're only North American team in the top eight. They managed to finish seventh overall. And to get there, they'd beaten Team 3D, the team that had all these legendary old players on Moto, Rambo, k -Shop, amazing players. But at the time, they were starting to drop off. This was one of their first bad CPLs. And this was the rise of this team with Frodo. And we saw at the time, he was one of the stars of the team. He was a very good AWPA. And interestingly, the way they used him within the strats would often be like, hold this one spot so that you've got like a line across the map. And if they cross there, you're going to kill them. And if they don't, you know that they haven't moved to this part of the area. So the in-game leader, Hare, would use fraud in a very tactical sense within how he was going to play the game or rotate him on a certain spot, so knowing we need extra defense here. So actually one of the first real tactical uses of a star player that you didn't often have in it back in the days of North America, at least. Now, in 2004... Things didn't go so well. They didn't qualify for ESWC. And then around the summer, there was this crazy decision made by the team, which had a logic to it, where they were going to make a land team that would live in Chicago. And so it was all the players who lived in Chicago all willing to move to Chicago. <clears throat> and so that meant in Frod's case, <coughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't able to. He lived in Florida. I think it might even have been in Miami. And he didn't want to move there. And also, it was, it was very uncertain. You know, there weren't like full salaries to the same degree back then. I mean, this team actually had like sponsorship and backing to go to events. But this was a risky proposition to do. And actually, that team didn't end up working out. But anyway, so Frog takes a big risk because then he ends up having to join this team Complexity. And at the time, Complexity were basically, they weren't no names, but they weren't a good team. Now, the reason they weren't no names is because initially they were famous for just signing players that like had some tenure in Cal Invite or something and trying to make a team. But more interestingly, the reason they got prominence is because the owner, Jason Lake, his name alias was one, actually. He had made a lot of bold statements in public. He kind of bragged about how they were going to be one of the future teams of the of the league, how he'd be the first guy to sign a million dollar contract for a player, how, you know, basically he had all sorts of, he did a lot of like PR essentially that got the name up, but unfortunately got the name up also, it got, made them, a, had, gave them exposure, but it also gave them a negative rep where when they went with this like a decent but not good lineup to CPL summer 2004 before Frod joined, they bombed out. They actually had a player who had a fight, and so they couldn't have the proper lineup. But anyway, they bombed out really badly. And so as a result, the joke going into the winter season was everyone was saying, like, oh, it's the road to 64th place for Cole. They're going to bomb again. Because uh, when you're brash, if you don't have the results, people are going to love to go in on you and just talk mad shit on you. So Fraud was joining that team. And you have to realize Fraud himself didn't have the greatest rep. He'd always been considered an online. He, okay, he performed at the previous CPL winter. Okay, good. But like I said, not only did those old school players never respect you until you'd really proven it online, which I guess he had by beating 3d but because fraud was known as a shit talker and a very confident guy and a cocky guy admittedly he wasn't like a hardcore shit talker who just for no reason went super ham but he was more on that end and he was perhaps overly exuberant and cocky if he had success or beat people Th that just made those sorts of old school players like some of the guys in team 3d just despise him just hate him and if he had an accomplishment against him they'd try and write it off like oh he got lucky there or oh, who cares like he's a loser anyway and so you could see Cole, he was gonna have to make it the hard way and he did in complexity because at the cpl winter 2004 so two of them he's been to now at this one he finishes in fifth place which is a really big result for a brand new team especially a team that's not with legendary players and part of the result of doing so was to manage to beat some top European teams to get there. Mouse Sports, Destination Skyline. So these were big time results to get that high up. And you could tell already from his individual performance, he was the star main carrier of this team. And he was one of the best players in the world. Like, you, he, he didn't yet have the results to prove that he was. But just his performance here, you were like, I've already seen that this is this is the kind of performance where you can be a great player. You can be a superstar if you can do what he was able to do at that land. I remember players like Shagwa, another great opera at the time, who actually won that tournament, telling me like, this was this guy's real breakout like now we know he's legit now we know he's a world-class opera so 2005 was going to be his chance to really show himself <clears throat> now the team changed a player they got sunman in and they managed to finish second at cpl spain which had at the time most of the top teams there the only team they lost to was mouse sports who at that year were one of the better teams that had a change of lineup and had one of their best lineups ever they lost to them there actually got wrecked on dust two in the final but to get there Complexity was able to beat NIP, who had like legendary players, Heat and Potty, guys who'd only won in their careers. They were just legends, some of the greatest overachievers and winners of all time. Then, though, at ESWC, the, the big major of the year, the most important tournament to win, Complexity and Fraud won the tournament. So Fraud was like on the best team in the world, the world champions, and he was maybe even considered the best player in the world. And around this time, he was releasing lots of POV demos. So you got to see him absolutely wrecking teams in Cal Invite online. He was absolutely incredible. 
Now, the team went through a little bit of a slump towards the end of the year because they tried making a roster change, took out Sunman, brought in Exodus. That went badly. They lost a couple of lands to 3D. They brought back Sunman. Then CPL Winter was like the second most stacked tournament of the year, a really impressive tournament. And unfortunately, they only managed to finish joint ninth place there. They didn't make a big deep run there. And this was the problem with this lineup, actually. It had a great distribution of skill in terms of if everyone who did their job, they could always be competitive with top teams. Problem was, it wasn't a lineup with lots of skill throughout the lineup. Fraud was a superstar. He was one of the best players in the world, a really sick opera. But then you had like Sunman was like a good lurker with good skills, but he wasn't like a world-class player. He was maybe bordering on a star. Then you had Trip and Warden were really just supportive players. And then Sunman was just like an okay middling player, but who was good at clutch runs. So you had the roles covered, but it meant everyone had to do their thing. And so of the teams to win major world championships, this was one of the ones that had less skill in some sense across the team. Up there with Neo's Polish teams. Whereas at the time, a lot of the great teams in history had a number of star players here and there and an abundance of talent, especially the Swedish teams. So actually it shows how, how the clockwork nature, the machine nature of this call team, but everything had to be working right for them to succeed. That's why they'd have these big results and they'd have big top results. But then they'd also have some where they'd, just, they'd have an off tournament. Things wouldn't go well and someone played badly there. Now, in 2006, they got back up near the top again. They won Transatlantic Showdown when they managed to beat Mouse Sports in the final there. They went to the WEG Masters, which at the time was the tournament that the final had the most prize money in history. It was 70,000 for first place and only 20,000 for second. And even though Fraud had played incredibly this whole tournament, he'd been dueling against, you know, amazing teams. He'd been playing as Solo, the Korean player who's a superstar. He was playing as a superstar Fraud, but the other player playing as a superstar was Jungle from WNV, the Chinese team. And the Chinese team in the final beat Complexity in the final and won the 70,000. So still a top finish. Now back home, Complexity dropped off a little bit. They only finished third at WSVG Lan One. Actually got beaten by Team 3D, who changed their roster a little bit and had a little resurgence over that summer. Likewise, Team 3D finished better than them at ESWC, where this time the reigning ESWC champions, Complexity and Fraud, were only able to make it to the round of eight, and they lost out there. Then they followed that up, though, with like a revenge game where they went to WSVG ISC, and here they were able to win the tournament. Now, in the upper bracket, they made it all the way to the upper bracket final, and the upper bracket game was on Nuke. And this game, Fraud, amazingly, went absolutely ham. I mean, remember, this isn't a map where often in 1.6 you couldn't really use orps very much. He went ham. His AK was nuts. His rifle was really impressive. He had like maybe 22 kills, but his team actually lost the game and by quite a big margin. Now, they made it through the lower bracket. They beat the Fnatic team, which hadn't quite become champions yet, even though it had Forrest, it had DSN, it had Khan. They beat them on train, and, and actually there was an interesting op duel there between DSN and Fraud. And then in the final, because it was a, a single, a double a limb, single map tournament, to win the tournament, Complexity would have to beat Alternate Attacks, the team that they'd lost to in the upper bracket final, twice. And so they did. They managed to beat them in two games. Both were like decently large scores. Fraud even got a knife in one of the rounds. I mean, this was big time stuff and they won another big championship as a result. Skip it over a bit. They got, had more success in North America at this point in time. They established themselves again as the best team. Fraud actually at the time had never been to a World Cyber Games because that was like a national tournament, like an Olympic style. And the big problem for Fraud was only one team from North America in those years used to get to go. And Team 3D, even when they dropped off and Complexity was better, somehow always miraculously would win the qualifier. They'd won every single year. So again, they'd won it this year. But at the final, at this WCG Pan America tournament, where it was all just the Americas playing each other in a mini tournament after WCG, they had this weird thing where one player, I forget who it actually was, I think it might have been Dominator from 3D, couldn't play at the this tournament. And so since Rambo was like or Method or someone was friends with Fraud. They invited Fraud to play with them as a stand-in, and they finished second here. They lost to MIBR. Kogu was the legendary opera at the time, and they got the gold taken away from that. But it was the first sort of like that style of international tournament for Fraud. Now, the problem is... Um, let me think. At the end of 2007, here, 2006 rather, here's the issue. The last two tournaments of the year were a flop. Again, it was a flop at the end of the year for Complexity and Fraud, where these two huge tournaments, CPL Winter, super stacked tournament, they went out in the group stage, and the WSVG NY Finals had mad money for first place, $50,000 first place and a Rolex for each player. They just went out really early there. So they bombed the last two tournaments. And actually, that would be the end of 1.6 for a few years, because at that point in time, most of the North American players, including Fraud, switched over to Source to play in CGS, which is the Championship Gaming Series, an online televised league televised not online rather on cable television by direct tv owned by news corp and this tournament actually fraud was one of the best players and he is all being adapted and call were one of the best teams they had zet in their lineup from sweden who'd been in an ip one of the, probably the best player in the world in 2006 and 
in this tournament, individually in source, they were really good. They were the best team in North America. The problem was the franchise system, they couldn't qualify for the world finals, but they got to go there and the, they had a mini individual tournament just for source and they won that. In fact, they won a number of lands this year. They showed they were the best source team probably, but they didn't have the chance to compete internationally because of this stupid franchise system. Now, after a couple of years, CGS went bust after the second season. So in 2009, end of 2008, it was announced that Fraud's coming back, end of 2008. And he didn't sign with Complexity, they left Complexity and they went and joined Evil Geniuses. Now in Evil Geniuses, they had this all NA lineup, but it wasn't working out really early on. Like they finished only joint ninth place at the IEM Global Finals, one of the majors, the biggest major to win actually. And it wasn't until they got Lurpus, the Finnish in-game leader, to come and live in America and play with their team that they kind of got these guys back into the rhythm of how to play 1.6 and what the new meta was like and how to have proper strats because they had the European meta coming in with Lurpus and he really invigorated the whole team. And famously, the first tournament they did really well at was Game Goon Mexico, where a number of top teams didn't attend, but it was basically a number of the, the really good North American teams, a couple, and we made Fox who were like solo, the best Korean team and, and a good international team, like a top 10 international team. They managed to beat We Made Fox. They won the tournament. After that, there was an IEM tournament in Chengdu in China later on in the year. And even though they only finished top eight here, already you were seeing signs because already they were able to come like really close to being SK on train, which is like a good map for SK. So you saw like, oh, they're going to be dangerous. Their real breakout, they had a few tournaments that they were really special at. At the end of the year, there was Our Black Cup Europe right at the end of the year in Sweden, Stockholm. They managed to finish third here. They got to the upper bracket final, but they lost on Dust 2 there. It was a single map, double limb tournament again. They lost on Dust 2 to SK, Valet's team with Tempol, etc. Uh, oh, no, actually, that was after Tempol. That was when he had Crystal and Face. And then in the lower bracket, they had to play MTW, the Danish team, who actually had a stand-in, Arcadian, but it was Trace and Ave and Zonic. And they managed to lose there on Dust 2 as well. Both close games. And so as a result, they finished third. But third was still a very good tournament. They faced ahead of a number of teams, including the legendary Polish team of Neo, who had all those majors. So this was a really good finish overall. Then in 2010, they followed that up at the IEM 4 Global Finals the biggest major of the year. They finished fourth place. They actually topped their group. They got to the semifinals. Unfortunately, in the semis, they had to play Na'Vi. And this was Na'Vi's huge breakout tournament where Markov was the MVP of the tournament. And he went to head-to-head -head and Markov did out op fraud. It was a really great game. But they they lost 2-0 to the Na'Vi guys. So they, And then they lost to SK Gaming, of this time with Gox as a stand-in, who, who was really showing himself to be individually very good, having left Fnatic. And they only finished fourth. But fourth was still a sick finish for a top tournament and for a North American team who at the time weren't that relevant. Like Complexity were there, the second best North American team at the time, and they went out in group stage. So later on in the year, there was an Arbolet Cup Dallas tournament. There were some other tournaments I'm skipping over and there was ones that weren't relevant. There was an Arbolet Cup Dallas tournament. And again, they played Na'Vi in the semifinals. This time they actually wrecked them on the first map, Tuscan which is a map that Na'Vi could be a bit up and down on, but actually it hadn't been considered a great map for Evil Geniuses. They wrecked them completely, like 16-1. Then they lost the next two maps, got co totally wrecked on, uh, I think it was Train and then Inferno, and just got bodied. Unfortunately, Markov, because his style was super fast stopping, yet incredibly accurate hit rate, that was like almost like a counter to Fraud style, because Fraud style was more the slow and stable with some flick shots mixed in. So, and obviously Na'Vi's team was much better. That year they won everything. Uh, there, again, there was a there, there were WCG tournaments in 2009-2010 that Fraud got to go to, but unfortunately, because Lopez, their in-game leader, was finished, they had to use a stand in there, and they never made deep runs. They never got past, like, top eight of these tournaments, even though those were the first proper WCGs Fraud got to play in. So there was another Pan America tournament. In fact, there was two tournaments this year, Pan America for WCG and IEM five European champ American championships, where, again, they had to play Brazilian teams in the final, but this is when Kogu had retired. So now they actually lost in these finals to Fallen's Fire Gamers team later Complexity who essentially were like the MIBR players plus Fallen instead of Kogu. Obviously Fallen's a great player now. Fallen also a player who could go head to head with Fraud. Very good AWPer in the world. Incredibly skilled. But also had very good rifles. The key tournament of the year really was the MSI Beat It. This is a tournament in China with like a, a few top teams and one of them was Fnatic. And Fnatic was probably the second or third best team in the world. Had an amazing lineup. One of their greatest lineups of all time that had gotten back together with Gux with, together with Forrest and Get Right. And in this tournament, they actually, the complex, the three Evil Geniuses team of Fraud managed to win two to one and win a LAN over Fnatic. So big time stuff, but it was a smaller LAN. Now, one of the last events of the year was unfortunately kind of a controversial one for this team because at WEM, World Esports Masters in Hangzhou, China, in the lower bracket, the same Fnatic team that they'd beaten in the MSI Beat It finals 
was playing against the Evil Geniuses team. And it was a dust two game, ended up being an overtime game. And unfortunately, the game was decided by a 1v1 of Lurpus and Forrest. And it was claimed after the fact that Frod had ghosted and said to Lurpus, like, oh, he's, he's, he's coming now from the tunnels or something. Oh, he's behind the box or something. One of those two things. Or, I, no, I think what happened was, Lopez was the CT in the 1v1, it was in the B site of Dust 2, and what happened was, Forrest was on the bomb initially, then he came off the bomb, then Lopez won the 1v1, I think around the plateau box area of B site. And supposedly, Frod's ghosting was to say something like, he's off, he's off, he's off, he's off the bomb. And then Lopez won the 1v1. Now, Lopez told me he didn't hear anything that Frod said. I mean, you have to realise, Frod also talked a lot of shit, and had a bad relationship with Lopez at times, so it's it's not it's logical he might actually just not listen to what he's saying and just disregard him. Plus, when you win your 1v1, you think he yourself. But, there was a video released where he, you could see him talking. Now, interestingly, the Fragbite people put subtitles over that video, but I listened to the, I'm a native English speaker. I listened to the video with no subtitles on, and I couldn't make out the words that they then put subtitles for. So I thought, always thought the whole thing was a bit fishy. Frod clearly talked, so he tried to ghost. It's whether he said something relevant and whether Lopez could hear him and actually acted on it. That's what we'll never know. And the reason why he was able to ghost is because there was actually the screen stage setup was terrible, and if he looked over to his right, he could sort of see like a like the projected screen that the fans were watching because he was behind it somehow and he could sort of see an angle out so he could see a little bit anyway that's just a small incident but unfortunately for example khan to this day always brings up like front ghosted against me so it, it was worth mentioning as a little story now at the end in 2011 at the end of, i think it was around the end of 2010 the team cut lurpers actually because of like just friction between him and fraud because he didn't like the way fraud like was maybe egotistical sometimes or they had some kind of beef personality wise and the team got a different player in and things went to shit immediately. They've got an Iraj Kanji as their leader from Complexity. You'd played with Deborn, who's one of their newer recruits. And they didn't even make the playoffs of the big IEM tournament. And then later on in the year, they'd even been dropped by Evil Geniuses. And Fraud did go to another tournament. He went to IEM New York with uh, Check Six, which was a number of his players, Warden and Fraud, from his old team. But some other players, Dizaman. And... At this tournament, they only finished 5th to 6th. They didn't do that well. 2012, he did a couple of ESEAs also, finishing 3rd with, with check 6 teams. That was the end of 1.6. That was the end of fraud, we thought. But then in 2013, he came to an ESEA line. He was playing online a bit with a team called Cultivation. Only finished 5th to 6th there. Nothing, nothing particularly special. Again, playing with Warden and, Fro and Storm, who would later go on to play... Well, some of them would play in Elevate. That was basically the end of his career, and he never really went hardcore at CSGO. Now, the thing about Frod was, and again, I actually knew him quite well as a person, talked to him a lot. Now, his style of orping was he was an orper first and foremost. He's the guy where he would buy an orp every single time he could on LAN, which not every NA player, not every great player even did all the time. He would buy it every time on LAN. He would get people to drop him the orp online, and he would carry with the orp. He wasn't nervous to hit his shots or to hit no scopes. Now, his style was the, the old kind of... Uh, epitome of the slow and steady orper he had extremely stable shots certain shots slower to medium ones he would he would hit them an insane rate like 90 percent, very very high but he had a few flick shots within that now it felt like he had a slower sensitivity i know he put his mouse zoom sense down so as a result it's more like he it didn't just have to aim and then wait for you to go through the crosshair he could also flick onto you but it would be a slower flick it wouldn't be like a super fast markov sunder type flick it would be a little bit slower but his hit rate was very good so he was a very stable opera and he could always hit the same shots he had amazing no scopes he's one of the best no scopes players of all time maybe the best of all time when you consider his tenure his success and how many he was able to get off he was maybe the best no scope player of all time incredible at close range and very stable at medium range as well. It reminds me a bit of how Alu Orps actually in CSGO, very good medium range Orp where you feel like you've got, you feel like you've closed the distance enough to get a good fight with him, but he's always going to hit those shots as you're closing in and trying to get even closer to him. Uh, because of his style of play, in the earlier days, he was a lot more dynamic. The pre-CGS era, 2003 to 2006, he would move around the map, he would go and take early peaks, he would take OM duels, and he would win them with the AWP. Now, in the latter days of 1.6, he was still a stable player. He wasn't as good post-CGS, wasn't close to as good. He he, he, had to, he was like a star player for his team, but he wasn't a superstar player in the world at that point in time. He was one of the better AWPers, but he wasn't the best AWPer. Like, people like Markov, etc., dwarfed him. So... The big issue there was, in the latter days, I noticed he became a lot more hesitant. Like, he would play the same spots over and over again, and he would want the same angle to cover. And if he covered that angle and they didn't come there, he wouldn't always make plays and go to the other parts of the map. So he was a bit more te tentative there. And, wanted, and, and it's not that he padded his score entirely, but he played a more 
reserved, limited game, but was still good within it. He was the best player in Evil Geniuses. He was better than nothing, who had a lot of skill and a lot of flair, and every now and then did something, but didn't have nearly the same level of star impact frag performance. Interestingly, throughout his career, one of the reasons why Frod always had to be put with certain support players, famously Sunman when he was in Complexity, when they'd play a map like Train, he would play the inside site, the, the train, I think the three train at the back, looking at the inner lower area, because he would have Sunman lurking around the site, always watching his back, always giving him info, always drawing attention. He always needed someone like a bodyguard to watch his back so he could feel comfortable taking those shots and angles without worrying about someone flanking him. So that kind of was a little bit more exacerbated in the post-CGS era. Now, back in the day, around, say, 2005, I think 2005 was his prime. That was when he was really god mode with the op. He was still very good in 2006, but... Around 2005, going into 2006, his rifles got really good. Before that, he was one of those oppers who used the op all the time and had, like, mediocre rifles where you just spray a lot. His actual tapping and bursting got a lot better going in in 2006, and his rifles got good. Like, they weren't world-class level, but they were good, as in when he didn't have the AWP, he still could have impact on the game and could still be the best call player. He was clearly a carry player. He was one of those solo, hard-carry players, incredibly good, that could carry your team to championships, now, was he the best AWPer? He's definitely top five AWPer of all time, if not top two or top three. In fact, I'd say he's a top two AWPer of all time. For me, the debate is between Kogu and Frod, because both played a long time, both were very good for a long time, both were the hard carry AWPers, solo carries of their team, who used the AWP every chance they got online, and both very good online, and good with all styles of the AWP. Now, it's true, if Marklov had played more years and had been more of a dedicated AWP, he kind of gave it up a year and a half into Na'Vi. If he'd have gone hardcore, I think Marklov had the talent and the land performance and the big finals performance, if he'd wanted to, he could have been the best Norper of all time. But he didn't have the same tenure of time, and he went off orping later on. So even though he was incredibly good for those single few years, like in terms of one year, maybe Marklov was the best Norper. But in terms of the whole career, I think it's between Kogu and Frod. And personally, I go with Kogu. He had a few more years at the top. He had a few. He had way worse teams. He was able to carry people in, against with what much worse practice in, in all different metas of the game. So for me, Kogu edges it, but it is right up there between him and Frod. And you can definitely make a case between the two. I understand people who pick Frod. He was also very incredible. Now, part of the reason I know Frod a lot better than people would know, would realize rather, is because I actually did a, a Counter-Strike guide with Frod. I wrote a guide that was with a player called Steel, a Canadian guy, not the one that plays in CSGO, a guy who was actually French-Canadian and actually originally Bulgarian from Montreal and his 3D teammate, Rambo. And then that guide was such a success, we made so much money that we actually did another guide, a follow-up, which was with Frod, and it was a 1.6 guide, and it was called Tau Frod, The Art of Frod. And... For this guide, it was like we'd even revamped it over the other one. Like this one had like not only text and pages and layouts, which is all formatted and looked like a very cool ebook, but it also had audio, like him talking about what he did in situations. Like, what would I do if I'm against a team where the enemy's going off? There'd be a little clip you could press play and listen to that for. There were videos showing like actual like rounds in a game where he did like a cool shot and then he'd be talking over it and it'd be slowed down like ah oh, see what i was thinking on this shot is i'm letting him come in first so i can take him and i know the second guy's going to be there we had a lot of like it was audio and visual and the text aspect so the thing is to this day you have to buy the guide it's like an online ebook that's like projected i won't say whether to buy it now because it is a lot very many years old and uh, it's going to be a hassle like changing the copy protection for people if it breaks etc so i don't give a fuck if you never buy it don't ignore that just know that it exists and we did the guy therefore i know a lot about his philosophy playing the game like he's a guy who for him mindset was very important that's why he was so cocky and confident because his skills he'd practiced so much he practiced a lot and he would practice certain things a lot that he would get his mind in a place where he had the confidence and if he went against someone who was already did well against him he'd try and think of a new game plan and he was a guy who would come up with a game plan then would stick to the game plan that's one of the things that made him a great player and he knew he had the confidence to be the carry player and be like listen you guys just play with me play around me and we can win this game and he could play that hard curry role so very interesting in that sense as a smaller side also when he joined evil geniuses that showed me what a piece of shit alex garfield is the guy who was the owner of evil geniuses because even though i did the guide before fraud joined evil geniuses alex garfield decided to tell me that somehow in his contract he now owned all likenesses to fraud throughout in perpetuity and through all history which i'm pretty sure wouldn't hold up and therefore claimed that even demo footage of him within the guide was technically owned by him therefore we weren't allowed to do any promotion with fraud like do game nights or giveaways and stuff because evil genius garfield claimed that he owned fraud's soul and everything about him, which obviously is complete bullshit but at the time Obviously, we don't know anything about the law. We're not going to go to court with someone. We just got fucked by that guy, basically. So, great guy. But anyway, that's just a tangent. I just went on there. Fraud was one of the greatest players of all time. He might even be a top 10 player of all time in 1.6. 
Now, how will he do in CSGO? From the clips I've seen online when he plays, he's still a good AWPer. I think he could definitely be a good, stable AWPer. Like, like I think if he really got back into the swing of things and he gets the right team around him, he could be like a JDM type player. I think he could be around that level. Now, can he ever be as good as like Kenny S and Guardian and maybe even Skadoodle? I don't know about that because it is a new game. It's one that I haven't seen him get to that level in. I'm always very hesitant about old players who come back, you know. I don't just get on the hype training. Oh, they used to be really good 10 years ago, so it'll be mega now. No, I mean, Frost Prime was 10 years ago, so I need, still need to see a lot. He has to prove it to me, just like he has to prove it to everyone else and maybe himself even. So obviously, it'll depend on the team he has around him. If it's not as good a team, it's going to be harder. But I think he can definitely get good. He can be it. Put it this way, he could be a top 10 NA player. If he really puts the time and dedication, he has a decent team around him and he has the experience. I think that's not unreasonable. I think that could happen. So that's what I'm interested in to see in CSGO, how he will do, especially in this new era with the Turner League and big money leagues and a chance to go fully pro and just practice all the time. Because he did, it was a guy with a good mentality and he did know, as I found out doing the guide, some good tips and tricks and mental ways of framing around as an AWPer that were definitely ahead of some of the things of some of the other oppers I talked to, especially NA oppers, who were, maybe could hit the shots but didn't have the same mental approach, didn't have the same fortitude when it came to actually playing the game. And he was a clutch player. He wasn't like an amazing clutch player, won all the 1v1s and stuff. But bearing in mind, a lot of time he'd have to use an AWP and use like mad no-scopes in 1v2s and stuff. He was a clutch player and he was a clutch performer in terms of big game impact performer as well. So that's who Frod is.